Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ MV, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. She's in a, a journalist, a yes. political uh, columnist. Yes. Lauren Duca. Hi, thanks for having welcome, me. Welcome, Good welcome, morning, welcome. Good morning, Lauren. She's got a new book out, too, called How to Start a Revolution. Mm -hmm. But before we get to that, how did you get to this point? You used to write for Teen Vogue, right? I did. I uh, I actually woke up the day after the election and was smacked in the face with kind of the reality of needing to have a sense of personal agency. Mm -hmm. Like, I thought that I cared before about this big issue of equality, but I didn't understand the the that I was just thinking of democracy as like an abstract achievement mm -hmm. and not understanding that I needed to have a constant active role. And with that holy shit moment, I thought surely other young people have had this shift in perspective. And I started researching and reporting and talking to them about what was changing because mm -hmm. we're told that like, young people don't care and we're told that Americans in general don't care enough. But the reality is there's this system that boxes out our voices and makes them not matter. Mm -hmm. So since the election, I've been trying to translate politics into terms that the average person can mess with and mm -hmm. understand um, and feel empowered by. And this book uh, came to be How to Start a Revolution. It was originally called The Great American Dumpster Fire. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Great and my, American Dumpster Fire. Yes. Okay. And the good news is my finding turns out to be too optimistic. Mm. So in that, when I wrote that proposal, uh, the sample chapter was called Donald Trump is Gaslighting America. Yes, that and that's, that's what launched me kind of into this place where it was like, that went crazy viral and it was about mm -hmm. the disinformation coming out of the White House. And because it was written for Teen Vogue, there was this question of do young women care about politics? Do young people care about politics? And that's a bullshit question because yeah. we're denied any access to the conversation. Why do you think Teen Vogue was the right platform to express that? Because I would even think Teen Vogue would be like, ah, let's stay away from politics. Yeah, they <laughs> they were taking young people really seriously even before the election where we would just cover national news, like the Pulse shooting, we covered like a breaking news desk mm -hmm. right next to whatever Selena Gomez was up to on Instagram. Um, and that was actually a really powerful part of the article. So the article, I think, went viral because people knew Trump was lying. Nobody, ever, anybody could have told you, probably even his supporters are aware that he's constantly lying. Mm -hmm. But that I, the idea of gaslighting is that we're getting all these conflicting views of reality and but we're seeing it again now with impeachment, where he's doing the same act that he, yes. the impeachable offense that he did on the call, he's doing in broad daylight yes. as if to act like, oh, of course, I always thought this was OK. Right. I always thought that, that my goal was to investigate corruption. That's just another form of gaslighting. And what gaslighting is, is it makes us doubt our own sanity because we say, of course, using the power of the presidency to for your for own political favor can't possibly be OK. But then him doing it in broad daylight, we say, well, maybe I don't know. Well, maybe I'm not qualified to say fuck that like this is absolutely a, a not yet another egregious act um and the gaslighting article when it first came out was he contradicted our intelligence agencies mm -hmm. um and said you know the, what are we supposed to have as a foundation of truth how are we supposed to at all be acting as citizens if we're so if we're feel insane about what's even true so that that's that's what the piece was about and i think the conversation extended beyond that because there was this question of like do young women care um, and I think I got like compliments about it where people were like, oh, this is so good. Maybe you should have run it in the New York Times or another respectable, more respectable publication. And I felt like that was emblematic of all of this patronization and all of these ways that mm. young women are kept out. Um, and I saw it really clearly. I went on Fox News shortly after the article took off. I remember that. <laughs> and Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson. It's crazy because at that time, like now he's the poster boy for white supremacy in a way that is just so egregious and over the top. He's on the news explicitly calling immigrants dirty. I for mean, people that don't know, tell them what they, what he what he said <laughs> to, to to you. Uh, so he told me he told me to stick to the thigh high boots, and what that meant was stick to writing about fashion, stick to writing about entertainment, and the other posts I had been writing for Teen that's, Vogue. That's at like the time. telling a woman stay in the kitchen back in the day. Exactly. That was so disrespectful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was surprised when I when I seen it. I'm sitting there like I can't believe he just said that. Totally. And, you know, I think it's emblematic. I, it's funny because it was shocking in the moment and it resulted in a lot of harassment, which is a whole other piece of the conversation. But on some level, I'm grateful for it, like because it was just such an obvious bullseye. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's happening kind of across the board. The, these these awful, oppressive people are messing up and they're putting all of their hate in plain view. And you see all of this 
sexist shit, all of this racist shit is coming out into plain view. It was always there and they were sort of always hiding it in a sheen of respectability. Mm -hmm. um, and like the way that pop, the fashion and entertainment is kept separate from politics is totally intentional and meant to deprive us of power because we're, you know, young women are are experts in mm -hmm. things like thigh high boots, right? Mm -hmm. And things like pop stars. Why can't we be talking about those things in the same breath? And it's totally absurd because to be participating politically, we're at we're engaging in the question of how do we live together? What's the best way that we as a society, as a country, should all live together? We have to be enjoying our lives while we're doing that. And like my favorite way to put this is like who decided that golf is so serious? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> who came up with a that? Old white man. That's exactly yeah. anyone can play golf. Anyone can hit that stupid little ball around. Like <laughs> and, that, and you see who the best player is, the black man. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you get right. nervous at all? You know, with, with so many people threatening you or coming at you, does that bother you? you and, know, how, and how serious are the threats? Well, you know, I think it made me, it's made me really have to level up in a big way. Um, because when it first all happened, it it was extremely ugly. Mm -hmm. uh, and and just, just, just like seeing that underbelly of the internet is overwhelming. Like there was a fo photos of Tucker Carlson putting me in a gas chamber. Mm. I was like, what is your messaging? Like, you're just full, like full white supremacist anger in my inbox. Um, but I've also received a lot of hatred and ridicule from my peers in New York media. And I think that there's there's this force of that's working against the our need to care, our need to show up and our responsibility to each other. And mm -hmm. the, the, the powers that block people out of the conversation that don't look like Wolf Blitzer is, is are so loud and angry and they come in all different forms. So there's like death and rape threats, but then there's also like socialists who think they're too cool and like are want to deride me for for having my wearing my heart on my sleeve and saying that we should care and i think if you think about like if a, if a white man in a suit came in this room and no one knew anything about any of us people would just be more likely to take that person seriously yeah. and there mm -hmm. are all of these bizarre secret rules that mm -hmm. make that the case and i think those are the things i want to tear down because based on what and i talk i talk with sometimes a vocal fry and sometimes i say like and um and i wear makeup and i like cute to be cute and then, and that does that can coexist with strong political opinions that matter and have value because I'm a political subject and I have a right to the political conversation and we're all denied that in so many ways and I, I'm trying to push back on it. I think that uh, the pushback you receive from uh, other media is really jealousy. Mm -hmm. Because I noticed when after the Tucker Carlson thing and your name started ringing bells, I started hearing people say, well, how, who is she? She's too young to be <laughs> speaking about the things she's speaking about. I think a lot of it is just jealousy. I think as your star rises, people get upset. Yeah, I, I wish I wish that there would be less, you know, I think that there's so much anger and toxicity on in the conversation online. And part of what I've been trying to say is like, if you're going to use your voice to contribute to that conversation, build up the people who are doing work you like. Mm -hmm. Use them to be like, yes, this is my shit. Please keep doing it and build people up. Like there's no, we're tearing each other down. And I think a lot of times like, Un people who are working in some way towards the goal of equality it's so simple but there's all these different ways to do it and there's going to be people making mistakes because like we all have been wired by the white supremacist capitalist patriarchy at this point and so like for example i'll get criticism like how are you trying to build equitable public power and sell your book on amazon well i don't fucking know i'm trying to reach as many people as possible right. like i didn't invent amazon why don't you go dox jeff bezos if you're so angry about this <laughs> 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 yeah in chapter five of the book, uh, Youth Potential, you discuss how your Teen Vogue article, uh, the Donald Trump Gaslight in America article, went viral and it shocked old men in media yeah. that millennials care about politics. Why do you think there is such a stereotype regarding how much young people care? You know, I I, I don't think it's a mistake. I, mm -hmm. I think I, 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 the best uh, way, I think, to talk about it is if you look at political campaigns, uh, they do nothing to appeal to young people mm -hmm. at just the surface level. Think about what's like the crap that's next to the cash register at Urban Outfitters, right? Like what kind of junk do you see that would probably sell on Instagram? What are the subway ads look like? Mm -hmm. You don't need to be a marketing genius. We could probably throw something together right now and it'd be a hit. That stuff is not wow. present. Mm -hmm. and, wow. and they're not even trying to reach wow. us. And the thing is, they're not even trying to make it access. They're not trying to make it accessible to us. And it's not just true to young people. It's true for all constituents. So the average elected official is incentivized to just 
keep things as they were when they got elected. And so for congressional races, sometimes that's less than 10 percent of the people they even are meant to represent turning up to vote for them. And then they get into office and we're supposed to believe that it's okay for them to just be fighting for their team, whether it's the Democratic or Republican Party, when really they're representing their constituents and should be working to say, hey, here's what's going on. I want you to have this information in a way that's digestible, that you can care about it, that you can speak up about what you want and believe. And all of that stuff is missing. And it also is missing in political journalism. Like so much political journalism is so dry and it's just boring why, at a basic why level. Why do you think it's missing now? I think that there's a level of performance and pageantry that's all caught up in the way in the way that the, the white supremacist patriarchy overlays on the political conversation. And then there's all of this, like that, that idea of the man in the suit being taken more seriously. They're all doing things in the way of the man in the suit, like with that aesthetic, with that that performance of respectability, that performance of expertise. And and they're they're cloaking. They're cloaking the knowledge that we need to participate in all of this insider language when like. Talking, so I saw a tweet the other day, and it was like, I'm sick, something along the lines of, I'm sick of Slack DM journalism. So like Slack, a Slack DM is, you know, it's a messaging service for offices. A Slack DM means the way that you're talking to people naturally. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. Why wouldn't we want more political writing to be the way that people are actually talking to each other? I tell all these candidates that come up here, these presidential candidates, the language of politics is dead. That's why Trump's messaging works, whether yeah. it's bullshit or not, because he's not speaking political language. Right, right. He's just, and he's just, he, that's exactly right. Like, how how can we better fuse this stuff? I think Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, whether or not, you know, you're you're on board with everything that she stands for, just the way she's trying to reach people is groundbreaking. Works. And she's like, she's breaking down her policies next to makeup tips on her Instagram stories. Right. That's like, <laughs> that's where young women want to look at. And then, oh, and end this. Like, why right. does it have to be joyless and shoved in a suit? And I, I think that, um, you know, we're told that young people in general don't care or that like that we all don't care because these turnout statistics are so low. But where is the effort to ex- to expand? Where is the effort to invite us? And so part of what I looked at in the book is that there's this there's this a lack of agency. Like so this is true for young people because I fo- want to focus on young people because we're naturally going to be the future. We're naturally going to be in more leadership positions. Like the political awakening is available for everyone. And it also happened before the election with the Black Lives Matter movement. That's the shift is sa- and with me too. It's saying this is this whole system. It's not any one-off atrocity. It's not any horrible, singular horrible thing. It's not just Brock Turner raping some young woman behind a dumpster. It's not just the latest instance of police brutality. It's this whole system that makes it so that every, any given straight white man has a glide path to success, um, a cushion for forgiveness, and everyone else is scrambling. And this that system, I think, is revealed by Trump because... All of our political and media gatekeepers told us that this thing was impossible. Mm. And so, like, the structures that hold uh, that oppressive system in place looked endlessly authoritative and automatic. And certainly it felt to me like, oh, politics are this thing important white men do in a room somewhere. And what's clicking is, oh, God, they had no idea he was going to win. They have no idea what's going on. All of this is made up, and I have to be the one to do things differently. I have to be the one to have agency and decide that I'm going to m- take action and and actually stop waiting. So I interviewed all these young people who it wasn't even just about Trump. Like, Trump was this sense of urgency, but they they did stuff they were passionate about before, and and on issues they cared about before and decided to do it because of Trump, but it's not about him. And mm-hmm. that action and that nuisance of agency, I think, will last and has to last well after he is out of office. What got you into politics later. like this? What got you so <laughs> strong about politics? His election. His election. That, that was the turn right there, his election. What were you doing before his election? Sure, that's a great question. I <laughs> I don't know. It's like, I, it's hard to describe. You didn't have a purpose. Right. You got a purpose now. You're walking in your purpose. Totally. Yeah. I, I, try, I, I made a joke in the book, like, it's like, I don't know how I just, liked peekaboo before you know like everything's different now now that i know about object permanence like i i guess i thought that so i always was in the bag for gay rights um i actually came out earlier this year but i didn't know i was gay i was repressed but i was always like had a gay friend around and so i was very young like i was probably seven years old and i was like go equality and then like later even got feminism later even got the full understanding of racial injustice which is not just being taught obviously Mm -hmm. and so i felt like i understood that we were in this system of oppression, but I was just like, oh, 
it'll have to get untangled over time. Mm -hmm. And like things are going better. You know, Obama's president, the gays are getting married. Like it's going too slow, but it's happening and we'll eventually get there. And democracy is this magical self-cleaning litter box that will ensure that eventually we'll get to this place of true equality and like untangle the the like the racist disgusting sexist origins of this country that don't even include women or people of color in the constitution like surely that wrong will right itself and then to see it it things get this ugly and this atrocious and to have this racist sexist alleged sexual abuser be able to be in the office of the presidency it was just such a smack in the face it was like an ice bucket challenge for it's, my like it's like views. it's like the jo- it's like the joker creating batman <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. The joke, there was a joker, so being that there was a joker, there was a now a need for a Batman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you, I, get attacked, you get attacked a lot. I do. My I, joke, actually, my joke about the Joker is like, I'm like, I'm like, when my Joker origin story, like, it might have been when I was like getting death and rape threats, and then my like colleagues in New York media are calling me silly and stupid. Like, I could have just gone full crazy, been in like a bikini on Instagram, and started selling you guys like the sh- tea that makes you shit, right? Like, it's just like, <laughs> It's so frustrating. <laughs> and I feel like I'm holding myself to a really high standard. So, like, something that's interesting is, like, the word influencer is mm-hmm. made to be a joke and a silly thing. But I'm, I yeah, like, I'm influencing the culture. Why right. is that stupid? And why has that been made trivial? And I'm also influencing the culture, and I'm choosing to hold myself to a journalistic standard. So it's like I'm operating always by telling you what is true, by being clear when I'm expressing my opinion, and my goal is to empower people with information. And what sucks is that there's so many people who are who are scamming and grifting, mm-hmm. who are influencers, and there's no one enforcing those rules. And I feel like I'm still getting so attacked and beat down. There's been so many moments where I'm like, is this my like Joker breakdown? <laughs> like- Ivanka Trump, when Ivanka Trump was on that JetBlue flight, and you, yeah. you, you put a tweet out, and they started attacking you for that tweet. Yeah. That, that was why I went on Fox, actually, to talk about that of the Ivanka JetBlue thing. So that was... In- Explain to people who don't know what yeah, happened. Mm-hmm. It was so long ago that it was like... It was so she, 2016, she, I think, right? Yeah. She was flying on a commercial airline, which is just... Okay. Like, I don't need to even, like, go through the conspiracy yeah, yeah. theory on this. Why is she on yeah. here? And right. someone on her flight said that. Like, that was, that was the interaction. Some man on her flight was like, why is she on this flight? Probably what everyone was thinking. And the media made it as if she had been viciously attacked. And there was just such a lack of a conversation about, hold on, this woman is about to get an office in the White House. Never mind, like, hold on, fast forward to right now. I'm pretty sure that Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump, like, check me on the number, but have profited over Oh, about $29 million since he's been in office. And and the thing that I was saying is, hold on, what is her level of power that she's being given based on just being her daughter? I thought that his daughter, I thought that we could, I could go on Fox News and say, don't we need to at least hold power accountable? Mm-hmm. Won't, won't you at least be able to agree with me on that point? And I feel like Ivanka, right, is a cover for so many white women to think that this was in any way acceptable. Like, that's the current that I hear from, like, the suburban white woman who just, like, thinks that Ivanka looks like she smells good, has really great posture, and is always just completely polished and polite. And it's, like, this facade of of politeness, right? Like, probably if Ivanka came in here, she wouldn't be mean to any of us, right? Like, she wouldn't be cruel. She would be very nice. But what does that even mean? She's complicit in ushering in the most racist and sexist president that we have had in modern history, and she provides cover for him. Yeah, and if, you, I, if you're not speaking out against the problem, then you're part of the problem. And she was a sur- surrogate yeah. for him where she made it look like if, if this kind of polished woman could be behind him, well, then sur- surely he must not be that bad. Mm-hmm. Right. So, I mean, I think her po- her power is like, absolutely something that needed to be challenged at that time and the thing is too is that then i go on fox news and and what what mode are they even operating from that they they were tearing me down Mm -hmm. um assuming that i was going to defend ivanka's harasser like making this this myth of civility but which i would also add we should be giving a hard time to people who support authoritarian regimes. Oh, I'm just going to move politely out of the way for Sarah Huckabee Sanders on her way to get tacos? She was lying to, <laughs> you know, she was lying to the American people for an extended period of time. The amount of damage that she has done, that she, the things that she has provided cover for are allowed for crimes against humanity. She is directly related to the babies in cages, and I'm going to have to worry if she can like enjoy her lunch? Right. She should, absolutely shouldn't. And the, the, the media gets so in, caught up in arms over these made-up rules. 
what is this idea about civility and for these people? They should have absolutely no chance at enjoying public life. I, I would think that if I was a politician in that 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 position, I wouldn't want to be out in public. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like I just feel like you're opening yourself up to all type of criticism and opinions. Like right. like who's not gonna approach Sarah Huckabee Sanders while she's eating? Right. Now now should you? Probably not. But it's almost impossible not to if you care about this country, right? Yeah. I think I think that it speaks to the idea that we could brush any of this out of view. And like that's the most extreme degree, but that's part of how I was taught about politics, where it was like it's rude. Mm-hmm. And I, it's rude to maybe disagree. It's not rude. It's essential. Like, we all have to be able to be having these difficult conversations. And I actually mean that at the level of, like, go and get your loved ones who have been led astray if Chapter you can. Chapter 7, how to have a conversation. <laughs> yes. When you talk about your parents voting for Trump and how hard it was to handle that. Do you think, like, do you think... Have you had anybody that you've had to have these conversations with? Do you have anybody in your life who you need have you need to bring back to sanity? I know Trump supporters. Uh, I, I I have I have friends who I feel like support Trump but won't admit that they voted for him. Okay. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. they won't tell you. They're not honest they, with Yeah, you. yeah. So they find a way to defend a lot of his BS and normalize a lot of his BS. Mm. So I don't know anybody that's in my in my circle that's been like, yes, I voted for Trump. So like I think that at all levels, um, it's a it's a different thing. It's a more it's it's a bigger amount of work if they did vote for Trump, right? Mm-hmm. But we all need to be we shut down when people disagree with us. What what do we think democracy is like? Yes. Democracy is having difficult conversations. It's right. building consensus from debate. Hopefully, right? All of our goal is the same. My goal is equitable public power. We need to take back the wealth and power of this nation, which is being. I mean, like the statistics on it. In case you need to refresh, her, is like 0.1 percent of the population holds a fifth of the wealth. Mm-hmm. Never mind the influence and the power and what the actual conversation looks like. We all have to be actively part of the conversation. And so mm-hmm. that means, and we maybe get to it in a minute, like actively constantly raising your voice in terms of taking action, but also being able and willing to work through those things that are difficult and saying, here's what's true, here's our foundation of fact. And actually maybe somebody does need to learn something. Maybe you kind of need to tell somebody about themselves and they need to evolve, but allow them the compassion because we've all the problem is we're we're shooting for like total purity on the equality thing but we've all been programmed with this script like mm-hmm. from day 1 we've been learning in in different stealthy ways the script of this this white supremacist patriarchy and enforcing it in ways that we don't even understand especially men it's, yes and like the things that we think are acceptable the standards mm-hmm. we hold each other to are mm-hmm. all like stealthily a, 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 an extension of that mm-hmm. and i think like i didn't there's things there's there's things that probably like you could still learn about how to talk to women and definitely things Absolutely. i could still learn about 100%. how to talk about my whiteness and like mm-hmm. that's the other thing too is like i feel like we all could be responsible for the privilege we carry and not ashamed of it and be like i want to use this like mm-hmm. i definitely have privilege being white yes how can i use it to speak up and i'm able to take up more space so how can i use it to empower people and bring more voices in and teach people and get people to look at, like this system that is oppressing all of us at the end of the day. I say it all the time. We all have to use our individual privileges to combat prejudice. Yes. White people got to do it for black people. Yes. Uh, straight men got to do it for the gay community and so on and so on. Mm-hmm. Like we just got to use our respective, men got to do it for women. We just got to use our respective pri- privileges to combat prejudice. And act- Absolutely. actively. Because like I've had this, I've had a frustrating, um, I, I, you know, like my little brother is like a straight white man who I love very much. And so he's an interesting person for me because he, we, we, I sometimes, we disagree and we get into some spicy things. And I, there's some times when he feels like, oh, it's not my fault. It's not my fault that, that I like glide through the world in this way. And I'm like, it's not, Paul, but it's your responsibility. And I think I've even had to, I've learned it from him as it applies to my whiteness and also learned how I can have more compassion for it when dealing with it. Because there's times that I do just get angry, right? How was your family? I would love to see how your Thanksgiving dinner is, ah! your Christmas dinner is. Well, we've evolved a lot. Okay, okay. So how was it at, at, at first? Well, so so in that, in the way I was taught initially was like, this is rude. And you just shouldn't. So I was being asked, like, don't talk about politics, Lauren. Stop starting a fight with your, like, passion for equality. It's annoying. Right. And now um, then everything took off for me after the election. And they wanted to still not talk about politics. And I was like, first of all, I've had this awakening where I understand that politics affects every element of our lives. And we all must 
have a political voice. Secondly, this is my job. So like, I can't just not talk about this to you guys. Also, what are we, what are we going to talk about even? Um, and so I kind of just cut them off. I also didn't, <laughs> I, was, I had enough. And like, they, they voted for him. Like, I couldn't get over that. Did they tell you why? You know, I think that they, they are Republicans who vote for the tax breaks. Yes, and that's what I hear a lot. They didn't understand, they, it's not an excuse. But they they feel so tapped out. Like they feel they they I think they felt another version of what I felt, right? Where they felt like, oh, this is this vacuum sealed thing. It's all gonna happen as is. Like my I don't really have any role in it anyway. And the thing is, that's not totally wrong. Like the reality of, of our alienation is that the moneyed interests and like bureaucracy of Washington make it so that we're not really getting any real solutions mm -hmm. and things are just proceeding as if this is just the way things are and it doesn't feel like your vote really matters. So it's funny because the difference in how I felt about them voting for him the night before and the morning after, the night before I was like, we're in New Jersey. New Jersey's going to go blue. Their stupid votes don't matter. He's going to lose. Like I'm annoyed, but it's dumb. Right. And the next morning I was just like, Wow, my parents participated in this. I can't even, I can't even fathom. It was so wild. My dad was like comforting me, sobbing. And I was like, How are you comforting me? You did this. Like, it just was so, so where we got to now is, um, well, I actually had a crazy interaction that taught me how to reach back out to them. So I was on this panel and I made a joke about there being no principled conservatives. We could talk longer about that, but it was mostly in that context a joke. Some people giggled. One man, was furious and he jumped out of his seat and he comes flying at the table for the panel and he's yelling how are you going to say there are no principled conservatives how are you going to say it and as soon as i realized you know i was not being physically attacked i said okay who do you read like what writers do you need me to know about and he didn't have an answer and it was like oh my god what i i felt i didn't even feel smug i felt bad for him. I was like, you're this angry and you don't even know what the fuck you're yelling about. And I, I was like, that's how I have to get back to my parents. We have to say, here's what's true. Here's like, it almost was like going back to the gaslighting. Like the point of the gaslighting article is like, if we don't know what's true, we have no foundation for freedom at all. We can't mm -hmm. in any way begin to be citizens. We can't have a political conversation. We can't do anything if we don't know what's true. So I was like, mom and dad, as a journalist, I am just trying to empower people with this foundation of information. And that's the way we need to start talking. Like, here's Media Literacy 101. Maybe we can look at some news wi wires. We can look at the Associated Press and Reuters. We can look at the Washington Post and the New York Times. We can even do the Wall Street Journal if you guys want to. Like, let's just get on the same page about what the events are. And then we can talk and we can disagree and, and, and there's no being wrong. Like, we can, we can talk through things and I can tell you how I feel. And maybe you can even just, we can listen to each other and try to hear where we're coming from. And now my dad actually regularly will call me to talk about politics. He'll be like, what's your opinion on Howard Schultz running? Like, what's the deal who's with he this? For the, who's like, he voting for in the next election? Okay, so I don't I don't know yet, but I do know he's not voting for Trump. So that okay. is at least, you know, and he I've gotten like little gains from him. Like, I think that he, a lot of that like Republican because of the tax breaks mentality is about the meritocracy. Like my parents did work really hard, right? Mm -hmm. They definitely did. I believe in them. I'm proud of them. They taught me my own work ethic. I am grateful for everything they've given me. Things were objectively easier for them in, in ways that they wouldn't have been for people of color. Mm -hmm. And that is like a reality that I've had to like make a, do a lot of work explaining to my father because he knows how hard he works and he knows how much he cares for his family and he knows how badly he wanted to succeed. And it's hard to process like, oh, this wasn't all because of me. It's like, you did work hard, but there is this system. And I'll, so I'll do it by sharing with him facts. Like there was an article in the New York Times that was like uh, black young men and white young men coming out of the same actually socioeconomic background. So even like getting rid of that factor are have vastly different amounts of wealth. Mm -hmm. It's like, look, just, you just have to look at this and consider this. Like at broad scale. And so that's the difference I've been able to at least make with my dad is he's at least able to say, I can consider the whole system. I don't have him totally at like queer radical feminist yet, but like we can talk. He, he, he can't agree with what's going on in the current administration. Though. Like if you're no. a true American and you care about, you know, patriotism like you say you do, you have to notice being a traitor is like one of the most unpatriotic things you can be. Right? Yeah. How, how can anyone be justifying this at this? Like that? that's what's, I mean, I think that that's another thing, I, I, another point is like, we have this system where we have these two parties who are giving us like, these shitty binary choices. But then there also is the problem of like what's happening with the Republican Party and like the idea that any 
of these any senator don't even want to talk about what party they're from could defend this behavior mm -hmm. based on allegiance to their party is absurd because it's just like completely loses sight of the fact that these people represent yes. us these people represent the american public and we're like oh mitch mcconnell is obstructing every policy solution and not offering alternatives because he's a republican that's unacceptable like it's, it's of course it extends beyond trump we're like Look at what Mitch McConnell has done to to our country. He has obstructed solutions on climate change, on gun reform, Voting. on health care, on electoral protections, mm -hmm. ev everything you can think of. Pl all of those policy issues, by the way, the majority of the American people want solutions on those things. He's blocking anything resembling solutions and not offering alternatives. And then suddenly he's just obstructing everything that can get through the Senate. And then suddenly he's a big enabler when he's adding judges to the court who want to blow, block abortion access, right? Like, 150 of them. Hun mm. Like He has <laughs> fundamentally reshaped the American judiciary system. And then the idea is that he's operating out of allegiance to his team. I think that that's what we big thing we need to do away with. We can't accept that, oh, there are just these two teams and everyone's playing for their teams. We're all the American people and as a collective, we need to have the power of the majority, the solutions that make will make our lives easier to live, that will provide us with health care, that will get us out of these loan crises and that will like restructure and shape these widespread inequalities. Like we can't we can't just accept that these two these two crappy parties are going to create like a, a a lesser evil for us. We need like positive, productive change that we're excited about. But I do think we're starting to see it. Like I think that the way the part of this shift that I'm charting in the book and part of what young people are doing differently is they're just running for office now and they're just starting the nonprofits and they're they're doing the things that they thought. Oh, I wish someone else would be doing this. Like there was a lawyer. Her name's Kat Calvin. This is a cool organization called Spread the Vote, mm -hmm. and they make sure people have the IDs they need, which is like. There's this whole level of how we box people out of citizenship. There's like a homeless man she helped. He had to pay $600 in fines, probably for like sleeping on a bench or something awful like that, right? Just to be able to get to the level where he could vote, where he could be wow. recognized as a full human being by our government. But so she, she was a lawyer. She had like a cushy job in LA and she actually did, she was active before, but when, when he won, she said, that's it. I'm quitting my job. I'm starting this nonprofit. And there's so many other people that like decide, made the decision to run for office on that day. Um, and I think that the thing is like, there's going to be big losses. Like this isn't all just going to magically sweep and change. Even if we elected like the greatest possible leader in 2020, mm -hmm. it would, it would need to extend beyond that and be like a constant daily active thing. I love your passion, man. I, I love <laughs> oh, your no, passion. Lauren gets busy. <laughs> So, so, so my, 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 I guess my final question is like, how do you start a revolution based how, off everything you you said just now, yeah. getting involved in politics and stuff like that? Yes. So okay. this, what it looks like is it has to be different for everyone. So I'd say level one is you need to get informed. And that doesn't mean you have to be informed on everything. I would say like, especially right now, if you're overwhelmed by impeachment, mm -hmm. me too. Like I'm not a foreign policy expert or congressional scholar. It is overwhelming. What you need to know is that you can need to get informed on the issue that matters most to you so you have that foundation of information. And then from there, you have the right to a political opinion. You are a political subject of this government and it's supposed to be by and for the people. So then what's your role within it? And and the, the, the final piece is to act. So not everyone's gonna run for office and not everyone's gonna march. There's reasons for not doing both of those things, but everyone has to do something. And my suggestion is that we do it constantly all the time, not just as if in response to the state of emergency. So what's the thing that best resonates with you and how can you do it all the time? So maybe you're regularly on the phone with your elected officials. Maybe you're making donations if you have the ability to do that. Maybe you are out marching and protesting. Pick, there's so many things that constitute making your voice manifest, making your political opinion heard. And I think we all need to be constantly actively doing it in the same way that we're brushing our teeth, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what's missing is, and it's not an accident because our voices are statistically non-significant right now. The sense of alienation, like you're not at fault for feeling like, oh, what is little old me gonna do? I, it's right. It's And it's the same as like, what good does it do for me to like recycle this plastic bottle? Well, not much. But if we have everybody recycling, right? Like it's sort of that thing. We have to build this individual action to collective power right. and take back this country from the corporations and moneyed interests that are making it so that we're all working multiple jobs in a gig economy without health care. While people of color are being brutalized, women are being raped without repercussions. Like this is not OK. Where none of us are OK with it. It extends way beyond Trump. And it also extends beyond traditional politics. It's a matter of saying, 
I have a duty to the collective. I have a duty. We are all in this together in the true mm -hmm. act. We have to take an active part in it. And if we're tapped out, even if we also are oppressed, we're still complicit in allowing this to continue. And I'm, I'm hoping that it can be a sustainable shift where we're all actively overhauling this thing all the time with the goal of creating equality because we deserve it. How to start yeah. a revolution. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 Lauren, you've gotten sharp. I remember when I had you on Uncommon Sense. You was good back then, <laughs> but I can tell that you really just been doing the research and doing the work. So that means a lot. Yeah, Pick I'm proud up the of book, you. Lauren Duca. Absolutely. How to start a revolution. How to start a revolution. Give me your Twitters and Instagrams and all that good stuff. Oh uh, yeah, at Lauren Duca and Duca dot Lauren um, on Instagram. And if you yeah, if you resonate with this book, it's been it's been hard actually. I'm not gonna lie to like get it to be over the impeachment noise. Um, but I actually feel like I just want to get it into people's hands and mm -hmm. take a read. If you're excited about it, share it with your friends and family, you know, leave leave a good Amazon review, do all that stuff. For, I would really appreciate it. Um, but I really believe in this thing, and I, I think that it can really be the foundation for for some uh, step zero for how we all create this new culture together. And I, I thank you for letting me come talk about thank it. Thank you. Today. All right, <laughs> well, it's Lauren Duca. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning.